our uh, national holidays, if you think about it, Thanksgiving is really, of all the national holidays, the most spiritual, it's even biblical. The giving of thanks implies a recipient of that thanks. Who do you suppose that is? Throughout the Old and the New Testaments, we are encouraged, we're even commanded to give thanks to the Lord. And interestingly enough, we are told in the scriptures that the fundamental expression of human sin and unbelief is thanklessness. Now we're going to go through a bunch of scriptures today. Hope you have a Bible or a device, but if not, we'll have it up on the screen. Why? Why have a Bible? Why have a device when you know it's going to be up here on the screen? Let me tell you why. Because the Bible is one. It's not a series of things where you snip things out and put them on your refrigerator or on your bumpers, right? The Word of God is one. And so, we're losing this, my friends. We are losing this as we begin just to chop things up and then just have little scriptures that we think that we know and we base everything on this. This is not the way to come at the Word of God. I had no idea I was going to say any of this. Um, we need to be people of the book because the Holy Spirit gave this to us. And If we are just people who know a couple of scriptures here and there and, and do not, if we are not into the book and seeing it uh, in its context, seeing it in its chapters, in, in the various books of the scripture, if, we, if we're missing all of this, we are going to become so biblically illiterate that we will not be able to stand as believers in a world that turns against us got to have the Word of God in our hearts. We have to get it in our hearts by having it in our lives. Alright, okay. anyway, it's going to be on the screen if you need it, but um, <laughs> bring your Bibles. We gave all, here I go again, we gave all the kids in, in our, our children's ministry of a certain age and up, we gave them a Bible. Because we are just intent on this younger generation having the Word of God in their hands to the place where when they want to know or remind themselves of something that's in the Scriptures, they'll be able to find it because they are literate when it comes to the Scriptures. We are losing generation after generation to any kind of knowledge whatsoever of what's in the Word of God. This church we're going to stand against that. Not so with us. All right. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 21. We talk about how thanklessness is at the root of a lot of human sin. It says this, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. For... Although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were dark. Thanklessness is at the root of so much human rebellion and the sin that damages us personally. And as a people. In a few minutes, we're going to take together the Lord's Supper. In doing so, we are remembering the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus in our place for our sins on the cross. That's what we're remembering. Because his death is the remedy for the sinfulness and thanklessness that marked our lives when we were in unbelief we received him as our Savior and Lord. 
Now, one of the names for the Lord's Supper is the Eucharist. You've probably heard this, the Eucharist. It's a Greek word that was just brought over into the English, but it literally means giving thanks. Giving thanks. How did giving thanks get connected to the Lord's Supper? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, listen to what it says. It says, it's not the cup of thanksgiving or Eucharist for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ. It is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. So Paul here is saying that this, there's something about thanksgiving being tied up with the receiving of the Lord's Supper. There's something about being thankful that's involved in all of this. Now, Psalm 100 is a song for Hebrew worshipers that calls God's people to come and worship. If you look at Psalm 100 in verses 4 and 5, listen to what it says. This, again, this is the invitation, this is the calling to the Hebrew people, let's come and worship God. Psalm 100 verses 4 and 5. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Notice that worship involves giving thanks. It's there twice. And in this particular psalm, what are the reasons given for being thankful? It says, because the Lord is good, because he loves us forever, and he's faithful forever. That's why we worship God. That's why the Hebrews worship God. And if you think about it, because God is good, because he loves, because he's faithful forever, what is the most magnificent expression of God's goodness, of God's love and his faithfulness? Well, I guess Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says it best. The biggest expression of God's goodness, his love, and his faithfulness. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, we express our thanksgiving through worship. That's how we, one of the ways in which we express our thanksgiving. And so when we gather together for worship, we're giving thanks. It's part of it. But beyond just sort of expressing it verbally, how should we live out our thanksgiving? Well, in the same book we just looked at, Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, we see that there's a component of living out this being thankful. Romans 6, 17 and 18. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves righteousness. Certainly, if you are thankful that you have been set free from sin's penalty and power, if, if, if you're aware of that and you're thankful for it, avoiding sin, putting sin to death, as, as the Bible puts it, living right, these are one way of expressing Thanks. If we're thankful for being set free from sin, we express it by saying, I'm not going to let this be in my life anymore. By the power and grace of God and through the working of His Word in my life, by His Spirit, I'm not going to have this in my life anymore. But here's the rub. Many limit the Christian life 
to just that. Avoiding sin, mortifying sin, confessing and repenting of sin. But that is narrow and incomplete and it can actually warp you. It's Christianity in the negative. Christianity. Here's what we don't do. Let's consider it another way. Have you heard of the concept of a life debt? A life debt? The concept of life debt is ancient. Basically, it goes this way. You save my life. I pledge lifetime allegiance and or service to you. And we've seen this worked out in all kinds of stories and examples. That somebody saves somebody's life, and then the person who has received that salvation then says to the person, I'm going to, I'm going to align with you. I'm going to serve you all of my days. Well, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says something really similar to the concept of a life of death. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul the Apostle's writing here, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer. But Christ lives in me, and the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Right? You see that? that that's essentially saying, I'm living now out of allegiance to someone else. I am living now in service to someone else. And this is an expression of living out thanksgiving. This Paul the Apostle in almost all of his letters in the New Testament, what is his favorite way of referring to himself? He says that time and time again in all of his letters, he calls himself a servant of God or a servant of Christ Jesus. And he lives his life that way for two reasons. First and foremost, because Jesus is Lord, and he commands this of his followers. He commands us to be his servants. But then secondly, he's so thankful for what God has done for him, for his goodness, for his love, for his mercy, for his grace, and his faithfulness. Not some sort of vague, sort of out there, generic kind of way. Paul doesn't see it that way. He sees it very personal and very specific. Listen to his words in 1 Timothy, a letter that Paul wrote, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Look how personal this is. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. You see this here? His thanks is all tied up with identifiable service. You see the linkage there? Now I'm going to talk to you, the people of West Springs Church, my, my family, who I love and cherish. I know you get this thing about thanksgiving being expressed in worship. I know you get that part. You get that. The other night was a Wednesday night. We had this night of worship here. 14, 15 songs of worship separated only by some scriptures being read, some, some things being shared. And just the heart of worship in the body here was just it was just wonderful to be a part of it, to experience. We weren't just in a little sing-song kind of thing going on here. Our hearts were being emptied out before God in thanksgiving and praise. Heartfelt worship and praise because 
God is worthy and because you are thankful. So that part, thanksgiving, expressed through worship, you got that right. That uh, avoiding sin, putting sin to death, repenting, well, you're mostly still a pretty rowdy bunch, but we're working on it. And listen, I also know that you have lives marked by allegiant service. So many of you here serve Jesus in this church. Some of you serve by giving sacrificially of your resources. So many of you do that. Some of you are deacons, some of you are staff, some of you are ministry leaders, some of you assist those leaders. Many of you serve in our formal ministries here. You provide food, like even today, for Circle of Concern in Valley Park. Many of you care for our children on Sundays. A good number of you sing and play and rehearse on our worship team, where you provide clear sound and video support. Some help in the library, some of you are out there greeting people, making sure that we're physically secure in the building and so on. And then outside the walls here, many of you are serving others, loving and reaching to your neighbors, serving in your schools and communities. A good number of us here at West Springs Church have paid careers that have a significant service component to them. Among us are teachers and school administrators, healthcare workers, law enforcement and correction workers, people who do social work. But because I am your pastor and you tell me many things about your life, I also know this. Many of you find yourselves sitting on the sidelines on the whole life of service thing. And I suspect that there could possibly be just a few who are sitting on the sidelines because you're holding on too tightly to your schedule and to your time and, and you kind of accept yourself. But I'm certain, though, that there are a good number of you who are sidelined or tentatively involved because you feel ill-equipped or you deal with doubt that you actually have anything of value that could actually make a difference, never mind having an impact, by you serving. See, I think that's what really afflicts a lot of us who find ourselves pretty much on the sidelines of having a life marked by service to Jesus out there in the real world. So, let's go to the scriptures, shall we? We're going to look at Exodus chapter 3 and 4 real quickly, then we're going to close. Let me just summarize where we are when we get to Exodus 3 and 4. Moses has fled Egypt. He grew up there. He had been adopted by Pharaoh's family, and he leaves and abandons Pharaoh's household after he kills this racist Egyptian overlord. He's got to run. And so he lived the next 40 years out of Egypt in the land of Midian. And it's there, after 40 years there, that the Lord appears to him in the burning bush, okay? Kind of familiar with that story, most of us are. The Lord appears to Moses in a burning bush. And then when he appears to Moses in the burning bush, he puts him into service. He gives him his career. In Exodus 3, verses 7 and 10, here's the job description. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now Moses 
has been sidelined for 40 years. 40 years he's been on the sidelines. So we see in chapters 3 and 4, God's given him his job, but Moses, he's got some significant reservations and doubts. Chapter 3, verse 11, when Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? Chapter 4, verse 1, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me? Or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you. Verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Or we get right down to verse 13. But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Point it down. He has the excuses that play and hinder so many of us. The things that go on in our heads. We actually think about seriously aligning ourselves as servants for Jesus in the real world out there. Who am I? I mean, I look in the mirror, I know who I am. Who am I to do anything like that whatsoever and expect it to make any difference whatsoever? It won't change anything. God just used someone else. So we're, we're getting this thing with Moses. We're being honest. We're tracking with Moses right here. Take a look at this. In this middle of Moses accepting himself, the very thing God has called him to do, in the middle of saying, it's not me, it's not me, what does God do? Chapter 4, verse 2. Then the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? A staff, he replied. You see, Moses was basically working as a shepherd, so this is his tool. Ordinary tool of a shepherd was a staff. It was the staff of a nobody named Mo. God tells him, take that staff. Now, if Moses had been a plumber, he would have been a plunger. If he was a mechanic, it would have been a wrench. If he was an interior designer, some swatches. If it was a nurse, a stethoscope. But Moses, Moses, well, he knows, looking at the staff, he knows what God wants him to do, so he does go. But look at how he goes. Verse 20. So Moses took his wife and his sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. The staff of Moses now becomes the staff of God. And what does this staff do? Read ahead a little bit, you find out this staff brings hail down upon Egypt. That staff brings locusts down upon Egypt. That staff brings round the heart darkness on Egypt. That staff of God in the hand of Moses parts the Red Sea. That staff of God in the raised hand of Moses allows these ex-slaves to defeat the fierce Amalekite army. My friends on the sidelines, what is in your hand? What you got? What you got? You got time? Is there time on your hands? Let it be the time of God. You got hands that can do some things 
Let it be the hand of God. You got a listening ear? Let it be the ear of God. You got a heart? I know you do. Let it become the heart of God. And this time, in this church, God is calling all of us to step up and serve His kingdom in ways far beyond all of our weak and puny capacities and far beyond our reticence and our reluctance and uncertainty. And He's asking us, each of us, what is in your hand? We have a student ministry for high school and junior high school here at West Springs. And we're without a leader right now. Nobody's fault. Things happen. Abilities and opportunities and availabilities all change. And we currently don't have a leader for junior high and senior high ministry here at West Springs. But you know, glory to God, some of you are stepping up with what you have in your hand. You're believing that God will make it more than enough. And I'm telling you, you will do that, and we'll all see it. It's coming. It's in the works. We dismissed the kids here today. I told you to pay attention to that. We have a large population of children in this church. It is the liveliest thing about us. This is an inestimable blessing from God. In our children's ministry, Kids Construction Company, KCC, we now have a new called and vision leader. But we need today eight more volunteers to serve once every four weeks as either a lead teacher or a classroom assistant. What is in your hand? You could lead my alley to Jesus. Somebody better. <laughs> you, you could be remembered for a lifetime as a grown up who loved and was a great example of God's goodness and grace our kids here right now. You'll be trained and equipped and supported. What's in your hand? What do you got? You, West Springs Church, out of thankfulness, you worship. You, redeemed children of the Lord, out of thankfulness, you turn from sin. And you called equipped servants of God out of thankfulness you serve with a full heart and whatever's in your hand. Now that